Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Selenium IDE Next Generation, with the brilliant Simon Stewart. Simon needs no introduction, but I'll give a short one anyway. So Simon is the Selenium project lead and the, creative, the creator of WebDriver. He worked at ThoughtWorks, where he invented WebDriver. He worked at Google, where he became the lead of the Selenium project and built the infrastructure required to run millions of browser-based tests every day. He worked at Facebook, where, among other things, he, st he set up the mobile end-to-end -end testing framework. Now he's the principal engineer at Deliveroo, and in his spare time, God knows where he finds that, he is also a co-editor of the W3C, which is the World Wide Web Consortium Specification Process. Simon has been active in the world of open source since the turn of the millennium. He holds a bachelor's degree in computer science from Nottingham University. And if you ever get a chance to meet him, do not pass on that opportunity because he is one of the funniest, nicest, brightest, and most generous people you will ever, ever encounter. So I do suggest we let Simon do the talking from now on. So Simon, the stage is yours. Oh, thank you, Eddie. That was lovely. Um, and good evening or good morning or good afternoon um, or good day to uh, all of you out there. Thank you very much for uh, giving up some of your time to come and listen to me talk about Selenium IDE. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this. I hope you are too. Um, yes, so as Adi said, I am the lead of the Selenium project uh, and we've been working on this for a long, long, long time now. Um, so without further ado, let's leap into the slides. The agenda for today, uh, we're going to quickly cover the Selenium ecosystem. So the main bulk of the talk is going to be about Selenium IDE, but it really helps to understand where that fits into the rest of the tooling that we have in the Selenium project. We're then going to talk about the IDE itself. We're going to walk through recording tests, test playback, um, and some of the enhancements that have been made in the new Selenium IDE that we are announcing. Um, and at the end, there will be some time for uh, Q&A. So feel free to sort of fire up your questions. And uh, I'm sure I will get to hear them at the end of this presentation. Um, I thought it would be nice to have a picture of a person lost in the wilderness. I don't entirely know why that seemed like a good idea, but that's what we did. So to begin with, um, let's discuss the Selenium ecosystem. If you take a look at a Selenium test that you run, um, this is using the uh, WebDriver APIs, you'll find that the Selenium system is made out of a number of different moving pieces. There are the language bindings, and they're on the left-hand side of this diagram, and they're marked as test here. The language bindings can talk to the Selenium server, which is the component that you can download pretty easily uh, from our website. We just released Selenium 3.14159 today. Um, so that's the latest and greatest version. Um, and we're about to start on Selenium 4, but more on that later. The Selenium server tends to run on your local machine, um, and it gives you access to various uh, browsers and, and things like that. If you find that what you need to do is scale horizontally, you can use uh, Selenium Grid. Selenium Grid uh, was written by Francois Reynard originally, uh, with additional help from a lot of people from the Selenium community. Um, and what that allows you to do is run your tests not just on your local machine, but on um, hundreds or dozens of machines scattered wherever they may be. Um, quite often you find that running in your, own, in your own data center. That then talks to a driver executable, such as Gecko driver or Chrome driver, which you probably have on your machine right now. And then we have the browser, which is what we control. Of course, very few people actually run their own Selenium grid. Quite a few people um, actually substitute a cloud provider um, in the middle. And cloud providers are companies such as Source Labs or Browser Stack um, or, or Push the Test, or, or like, there are loads of different examples. Now, the advantage with the cloud providers is that they allow, uh, they actually manage the infrastructure for you. Um, that's great because it means that you don't need a DevOps team responsible for making sure that these things work, that everything is ticking along, and that 
is uh, all the browsers are kept up to date. They will do that for you. They will also install new browsers for you as they become available. So not only do they have a historical depth of browsers, they also have all the latest ones, which is quite nice. They're also responsible for making sure that you can scale to running hundreds of simultaneous tests at the same time, uh, which is really nice because maintaining all that stuff on your own is quite difficult. And then quite often they will charge you for the, uh, for the service they offer, which is obviously how they make their money. On the other hand, Selenium Grid is self-hosted. If you have a handful of machines sitting around in a data center somewhere, or you've got somewhere some AWS credits to burn, um, then you can host this thing yourself. Now, the downside with that is that you need to maintain all of the browser versions yourself. You need to make sure that all the Selenium versions are kept up to date, um, and you need to, to make sure that all that stuff is good. There are Selenium Docker images out there, which simplifies that process. And you can take advantage of those Selenium Docker images by using a product such as Selenium, which is uh, an open source project that builds on top of Selenium Grid. If you're patient, you could wait till Selenium 4 becomes released because we are adding additional support for Selenium Grid um, to, uh, to support sort of modern technologies such as Docker, such as AWS Lambda and so on and so forth. It's going to be quite nice. The other thing that we're doing is we're taking a look at the modern world and we're putting in better observability so that people can observe what's going on as their tests are running uh, and figure out where system faults lie. Now, Selenium Grid and the cloud providers are all well and good, but they're probably things that you're not going to interact with very often. More often, people interact with Selenium WebDriver. Um, the green tick, by the way, is the project mark. And then um, the uh, red tick is for Selenium WebDriver. You will see Selenium Grid has its own sort of fancy icon. Um, I thought I'd put it in there. I thought it was quite nice. Selenium WebDriver is providing a, a library for browser automation. Many people think of it as a, as a test tool, but it could be used for any task where you need to do browser automating. Um, I know people who have used it for booking tickets um, on, on the internet when they're not able to do it. So they just run a script and, and it books the tickets for them. There are hundreds of things you can do with this thing. There are language bind bindings in almost every programming language you could imagine. So uh, not only is there Java and C Sharp and Python and Ruby and JavaScript, but other languages. I think there's an Erlang one. I saw a VB one ages ago, PHP. Um, all, all that. Um, because it's a library for browser automation, it doesn't manage browser versions for you. You are responsible for downloading the latest version of Chrome driver or Gecko driver or whatever it is that's most appropriate. And like I said, because it's a library for browser automation, there's no built-in framework for actually running tests. They rely on language provided tools such as JUnit or, or Jasmine um, or the .NET equivalents. So that gives you a lot of freedom in that you can do whatever you want, however you want to do it, and in the way that seems most appropriate for you and your company. But it also means that you have to make some decisions and you need to be relatively technical in order to be able to make those decisions. But the question is, do we need all this weight? Um, you know, writing tests is a time consuming task. It takes a lot of effort. Um, running Selenium Grid, well, that's a lot of effort as well. Um, do we need all this weight in order to record our tests and play them back? So here are some use cases that we consider when we think about Selenium IDE. The first one is, I'm not a coder. Now, I've met many uh, test engineers who claim not to be a coder. Um, and at the same time, they're doing amazing things in spreadsheets using macros, um, and they're tying everything together with VBScript um, or the equivalent in Google Sheets. Um, I'm not sure whether I buy the excuse that I'm not a coder, but I would believe that many people actually don't know a programming language particularly well. And for those people, it's really useful to have a visual tool. Other times, it's quite handy just to put together a working bug report as an example. So uh, let's say you're using a site, you find a repeatable error, you could write down the individual steps that are required in order to, to re reproduce that problem. Or 
you could give the uh, developers an actual test case that they could run on their machines and they could say, ah, oh, okay, I understand where the problem is, and they can begin debugging. Similarly, if you're getting started with automating a new test suite, so you've arrived on a product and people say, we need some end-to-end -end tests thrown around this using Selenium, how do you get started? Well, one of the easiest ways to do it is to take a visual tool, poke around, record some bits and pieces, and then output that um, as, a, as a language with a Selenium web driver and build your test suite from there. And also, it's a nice way of automating boring and repetitive tasks without having to delve too deeply into the structure of the page. So uh, you might want to, example, fill out timesheets using a tool such as um, Selenium and figuring out where to poke the, the timesheet application is probably not terribly interesting and may not be worth your time. Having a tool where you can quickly fire up a browser, uh, start recording a test, update the timesheet, and then save it would be a really useful thing. So those are the use cases that we consider when we think about Selenium IDE. So where does it fit in to the ecosystem? Here's where we were before. We have the test, the Selenium server, the grid, the executable, and the browser. IDE fits on the left-hand side. What it does is it's a mechanism for allowing us to quickly record tests and play them back. Let's go back in time. Many of you are probably familiar with the original Selenium IDE. This was developed by Shinya Kazatani, um, who took the original Selenium core code which was the um, table-based layout that used to run inside the browser, if you remember that far ago in the Selenium RC days. Um, and he tied it tightly to Firefox's internals. Uh, and he wrote an absolutely wonderful plugin, an extension to um, uh, Firefox, and that allowed you to record and playback tests. And it was lovely. And it was based on a technology called XPI, or Zippy, I think the Mozilla people call it. And uh, that used to be the way that all extensions for Firefox were distributed and made. The problem was that time changes. And the Mozilla folk realized that what they wanted to do was move to a multi-process model, like Chrome or Edge or, or any of the modern browsers. And they needed to make some fairly fundamental changes to their architecture to support that. Sadly, the existing XPI model that we used for all of the extensions was incompatible with that future direction and architecture. And so um, Mozilla deprecated it. For a long time, the original IDE was supported in the extended service release, the ESR releases of Firefox. But now even that support has disappeared. Now, some of you are probably using ancient versions of Firefox because you're using the old Firefox driver um, or the old IDE. Um, that isn't a great way of doing things because there are a vanishingly tiny number of people around the world who are using those old browsers. Um, if you're using Selenium WebDriver, then upgrading to Gecko Driver is a really good idea. Upgrading and how to do that is the subject of a different talk. And um, today we're going to be talking about the new Selenium IDE. So, you know, that's coming in the future. The original IDE was maintained by many people and with contributions from a wide community. Um, but I should give some special thanks to uh, not only Shinya, but Adam Goucher, Dave Hunt, and Summit Bardal. If you take a look at the logs, um, these people have done a lion's share of the code that has gone into the original IDE. And they took the idea from something that um, was re fairly rough around the edges to something that was key and integral to many people's workflows. So um, they are very much appreciated for all the work that they put in. But of course, times change. We can't keep on looking back. Um, so I'm really pleased to be able to show off some of the um, things we're going to be able to do with Selenium IDE, um, the next generation. We're still trying to pick a name for it. We're probably going to end up calling it Selenium IDE 4.0 when we release Selenium 4, um, just to keep the version numbers in sync and, and to make things easy for you. Um, but we're still not entirely decided on that. And you know, we might call it TNG because it's got a nice Star Trek reference, hasn't it? Selenium IDE, uh, the new version, um, has is, is basically the brainchild of um, Toma and, and Dave Hefner, um, Minoj uh, and Yunkin. And um, 
Apple tools have been absolutely essential in making this happen. Um, I remember the conversation, which I had a long time ago with Adam, um, one of the, uh, the senior Apple tools people, at, uh, architect. And he was talking about how best to contribute to the Selenium project. And I pointed out that Selenium ID was long in the tooth and we didn't really know what to do about it. He said, don't worry about it. Um, and before I knew it, he'd stepped in um, and Apple tools have devoted a considerable amount of effort to making sure that we have a new Selenium ID. So hats off to them. Um, these people are the face of the project, but behind that, there's been a huge amount of effort and commitment. So what is Selenium IDE, the next generation, Selenium IDE 4? Um, it's built as a web extension. So web extensions are the new mechanisms that are used for distributing um, extensions and add-ons for browsers. Now, the nice thing with the web extension is that it is standardized by the W3C. The advantage of being standardized by the W3C is that many browser vendors have support for this, um, in notably Chrome and Firefox. So whereas the old Selenium IDE was tied very tightly to Firefox, the new Selenium IDE can run in any browser that supports web extensions. Notably, that includes Chrome and Firefox, which are two of the most popular browsers out there. The web extension itself that we have, Selenium IDE, is based on code from Sidex, um, who were very kind and allowed us to use that as a foundation um, in order to, to build out the, uh, the new IDE. And there's also a load of code from the original Selenium IDE tucked away in there. One of the nice things this means is that we have a familiar UI. When you fire it up, it will feel like the old Selenium IDE. Um, but we've listened and we've paid attention to problems that people had with the old implementations. Um, and we've improved things that were common pitfalls, including locators. We've also added support in the core product for common tasks, such as looping and so on and so forth. And we will discuss that later. So the very first thing you'd want to do when you have Selenium ID is to install it on your system. Let's take a look at installing it in Firefox. Um, here you'll see what we're going to do is walk through the traditional mechanism for getting an add-on. So we go to Tools, Add-ons, click on Get Add-ons. And then we know that the name of the add-on is Selenium IDE. We go to that page, click on Add to Firefox. Yep, it's all good. We'll see that it's installed. And then in your menu bar, you get the Selenium IDE icon. If you click it, you open up the, uh, the new Selenium IDE. This is the latest release that we have available, so, uh, version 3.4.4. Just have a drink of water. But of course, it works on more than just Firefox. It also works on Chrome. So to install on Chrome, what we need to do is we need to go to the web store. Again, we search <coughs> for Selen Selenium IDE. We're not yet top rated. We've been in alpha for a while, but there are hundreds of thousands of people already using this. Click on Add Extension. Once again, you'll see the icon appear. And then we're good to go. So um, what you've seen there is that it's the same extension, but we can now install it on any browser that supports uh, web extensions. And we've made it available in the web stores and the add-on stores um, to make it super easy for you to find the latest version. Once it's installed, the browsers will make sure it's kept up to date. Once you have Selenium IDE installed, uh, the next step is obviously to record a test and play it back. We record a test in the browser. So here I have Firefox, um, and we're going to record a quick Google search. So we fire up the Selenium ID, and we say we're going to record a new test. We're going to give it a project name. So this is going to be, if we were writing multiple tests, what we would call it. I'm going to call it Selenium ID Webinar. Base URL, well, we're doing a Google search. So I guess we're going to go to google.com. We're going to record a test now. A new window opens. I'm just going to resize it so we can see everything that's going on. 
There we go. Nothing has happened yet. So let's click on here. Uh, and I'm a big fan of cheese. So why don't we do a search for some cheese? Do the search. Scroll down. And there's a Wikipedia link for cheese. Let's right click on that. And uh, you can't quite see the, um, the full thing. So let's scroll down a bit more. Selenium ID, and we can assert on text. That's great. So we finished recording our test. Let's stop recording and give the test a name. Well, it was a Google search, right? So we'll call our test Google search. So now we've recorded the test, what we can do is we can edit it. You'll notice that ID isn't particularly great. The target doesn't look very maintainable. Ah. But the new Selenium IDE has found a list of fallbacks that it could use. And in this case, we're going to use name equals Q because that's what that field has been called forever. We don't need to set the window size either. Finally, the assertion, that looks a bit brittle as well. We're going to take a look at the fallback locators that have been provided. And we're going to select H3, which is a, a heading three. Now we can just play that test back. Go to Google, type in cheese. It won't scroll, but it will find that text. So that's how we now record a test, and we can play it back. If you've ever used Selenium ID before, you'll find that very, very familiar. That's exactly how we used to do it. And the, and the UI looks very similar as well. Um, you'll see that there is a little floppy, floppy disk icon just above where we stopped recording, and you can use that to save the suite. The suite is saved as a single file in JSON format, uh, and we can use that later. If we wanted to, we could load that into another version of the Selenium IDE, perhaps running in Chrome, and run our test there. But you know, we might want to run these tests on the command line. Once they're recorded, um, we might want to put them into our continuous integration, um, or to allow developers to run that test locally and see what's going on, perhaps with breakpoints and so on and so forth. So how do you do that? We have a new Selenium IDE runner. This is a command line tool um, that is uh, simple to download and install. Um, and it supports a whole bunch of features that you might think are quite nice, including parallel, parallel execution. You can run more than one test at a time. Um, and that's super important because that allows you to, to take your, your test executions and run them as quickly as possible. Um, ideally, you could run all your tests at the same time, in which case your test run won't be the accumulated length of everything added together, but the length of the longest test you have. So in the example on the screen here, 52 seconds. You can set a base URL for multiple de deployments. And if you wanted to, you could run with Selenium Grid or Selenium Server by passing a simple flag. And you can pick which browser you're going to run your test in by just passing through command line capabilities. If you've ever used Selenium WebDriver, you'll be familiar with passing capabilities for starting a session. You can pass these through on the command line, and they'll work exactly the way you expect them to. So let's see the new Selenium ID runner in action. It's pretty easy to install, by the way. All you need to do is either install via npm, in which case npm install minus g selenium uh, side runner, or you can install using yarn, which is the uh, alternative package manager for uh, JavaScript. And that's yarn global add. Both npm and yarn are very, very well-known tools that are simple to install and available on every operating system. So yes, a test run. What we're going to do, we'll take that test we recorded earlier, and we'll run it on Firefox. Here we go, cheese. Excellent. OK, so that test run was exactly what we expected. But now, let's run it in Chrome. The only thing we're going to do is change the capabilities that we're passing through. And here, you can see we're running in Chrome. Um, I don't know how easy that was for you to see. Um, would you like me to run that one again? In fact, I will run it again, and we can just um, see it in action one last time, because it is very fast indeed. So here we are. I'm going to run the test in Firefox. Uh, 
And when that test run is complete, what we will do is we'll run it in Chrome. And we do that just by changing the browser name that we pass through. Great. I mean, it's all very well and good to be able to run these tests locally. But what if you have a Mac and you need to run on Internet Explorer? Or what if uh, you have a Windows machine and you need to use Safari? How are you going to use the new Selenium IDE in order to run the tests on those browsers? That's a really common requirement. If you go back to the original days of Selenium IDE, we had a, a command line runner, and uh, that would allow you to do that by connecting through the Selenium server. And with the new version of the Selenium IDE runner, that's also a possibility. So what we're going to do here is we're going to um, run a test using the Selenium server and the runner, and it's going to be the same test suite as we, we had before. You'll see in the bottom window, I'm starting up the Selenium server. It's listening on port 4444, the standard port. So I'm going to pass in this flag, HTTP localhost port 4444 WD hub. I'm going to run. As you can see in the bottom window, there's output from the Selenium grid, from the Selenium server. So we're using this to communicate with our server instance. Now, if you were using a company such as Source Labs or Browser Stack, you would be able to uh, place their URL um, in that location, and you'd be able to run your tests across the internet on their infrastructure. So this is a mechanism that allows you to take your existing Selenium tests and scale them out horizontally to as many instances of a web browser as you feel necessary. So um, we've recorded our tests, and we have them available. Um, like I said, the tests are recorded in a um, simple format. I'm sorry, there's someone just pushing an enormous tray of drinks past my puzzle room I'm in. That's a bit unusual. Um, I don't know whether you heard that. If you didn't, I've just been talking nonsense. <clears throat> Pardon me. So we've recorded our tests. The tests are in the form of a single JSON file. Um, that's a JavaScript object notation. That's the sort of common format we um, store data in these days. Um, but obviously, your developers um, aren't able to use that. What we'd like to be able to do is export those tests to a programming language, such as Java or C Sharp. Um, or Python, or Ruby, or you know, JavaScript. Um, and this is one of the key features we need in order to be able to go to beta. We're currently in alpha, um, and we're really keen to get going on this. So the good news is exporting tests, which used to be a key feature of the old IDE, is coming. Um, the work starts in the next sprint, um, which is probably going to be sometime uh, next month. We expect to start with Java. Um, because that is the language that so many people use. Um, it's incredibly popular. If you take a look at Selenium web driver usage, um, uh, Java is the one that almost everyone uses. So we have other enhancements um, within the Selenium IDE over the old IDE, and you may be interested to uh, understand what those are um, and how we can take advantage of them. First one is control flow. Now, back in the old days, uh, there was no mechanism provided by Selenium IDE for doing control flow. You could never do loops, for example, um, or conditionals. Um, and this is one of the key things that we need in order to be able to have properly maintainable tests. You need to be able to go, well, if we're on a page, and if this is present, then what we need to be able to do is this particular task. Um, and otherwise, we need to do that. And that was really difficult. Or sometimes we want to be able to go, you know what, I want to, to loop around this particular thing a few times. Um, for example, you might want to loop over each of the days of the week and put in how many hours you worked um, for each day of the week. Um, and that would be difficult. But now, with Selenium IDE baked in, we have simple control flow statements. And you can see two here. There's a while statement in the top window, which says while. And then we're using a variable. And variables use exactly the same syntax that they used to use in the old Selenium IDE. And underneath, um, we have an if statement. Um, 
And this says, hey, look, if my variable is equal to a, um, then we're going to return a, and we're just making a simple assertion. This is a really nice capability that was missing before and was only provided by additional plugins. Um, this uh, is one of the key things that you will be able to use in order to have more maintainable tests. Fallback locators. You saw when we were recording the tests that actually we fell back to, uh, we had a, a number of, of, of locators that were provided. Um, when we record, we record something like five different fallback locators that could be used. Um, and if you take a look at the file that is saved, all of those locators are there. What that means is that if you find your page changing underneath you, maybe one of those other locators will be used. <coughs> um, and this is a mechanism to allow your test to be more resilient to things going wrong. Um, so take, for example, that example we had before where we went to Google and that search box was LSB um, and some random string. That seems like the kind of thing that would have changed. If we hadn't done anything, we'd have found that locator working until suddenly one day it wasn't, but then the fallback would be used, name. And name equals Q would have worked and our test would have been resilient. Um, this is really, really important because one of the problems that we find day in, day out, whenever people are using Selenium, is that they say that it's unstable, that it's brittle, that it doesn't support the things they need to do. And part of the, one of the, the major reasons for this is that the locators um, tend to be hard to write and hard to maintain. Quite often people will right click on an element in, in um, DevTools and get an incredibly long X path. And that X path is uh, fragile and prone to breaking. By recording the fallbacks, what we do is we provide a mechanism that will encourage people to, to do the right thing and have these more stable tests. And the nice thing is, they tend to favor CSS over XPath. And so they tend to favor the part of the application that other people on the project are, in, are, are using day in, day out. For example, your UI people probably care about the CSS, whereas they absolutely do not care about the XPath, the um, XML structure of the page. Of course, um, the developers of uh, the new IDE um, particularly those fine folks at Apple Tools, um, are doing everything they can to provide all the capabilities that you might need. But they can't think of all the things you need, um, and they can't write the code as quickly as you'd like to. And so the new Selenium IDE supports the concept of plugins. Um, this is really well documented on the wiki. So if you go to github.com slash seleniumhq slash selenium dash IDE, um, you can find the wiki and their instructions on how to make plugins. And our plugins are a mechanism for allowing us to enhance the capabilities of the IDE in a way that is simple and easy to maintain and that is kept up to date automatically using the extension mechanisms that are provided by the browsers already. What can you do with it? Well, you can add new commands. If you fancy a new looping construct, well, maybe that's a possibility. If you need an assertion that's specific to your company, that's also a possibility. Perhaps we could use it for adding integration with um, third-party JavaScript libraries such as React or Angular. Those are all possibilities and would make really great projects. One of the things that made the old Selenium IDE so, so interesting and capable was that the community stepped forward and wrote new plugins and added new commands. Um, I'm really hoping that we see more of that um, and the same sort of spirit of adventure and excitement um, and figuring out what we need to do. You can also use plugins to add new locators. This feature somewhat in beta, but it's being worked on um, and it's pretty nice. And so Selenium provides a number of, ex of, of location mechanisms already. ID, name, XPath, CSS, I'm sure you're familiar with them. But what if you wanted to add your own custom extension? For example, by looking for an attribute of a, web, of a web element. Well, the plugin mechanism allows you to do that. It also allows you to control setup and teardown of tests. So if you needed to, for example, log into some third party system before you did anything, that might become a possibility. Um, it's probably also a really nice way of um, flagging to your systems that a test run is underway. 
So these are all things that you can do with plugins. I'm not going to show you how to write a plugin here. It's beyond the scope of this talk, and we've only got 15 minutes left, and I intend to leave some time for questions at the end. But um, if you are interested, you can just go to the website of the project, which, like I said, is github.com slash forward slash, uh, forward slash selenium HQ forward slash selenium dash IDE. And you can have a look at the uh, wiki, and there is a really great guide on how to get going on that page. So we've had a really quick blast through the new Selenium IDE. Um, but what are the things that are coming? One of the things that I talked about was the ability to export tests to programming languages. This is a key part of many developers' work. If you remember, one of the early use cases that I discussed was the ability to uh, quickly record a test um, and use that as a scaffolding to put together a, a more maintainable um, and, and uh, a, a more maintainable test framework that you can hand over to developers. Um, and developers love a programming language. They're not really very good at writing raw JSON. So being able to export tests to a programming language is super important. And when that happens, we're going to move to the beta. We're also planning on supporting data-driven testing. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to load a CSV and have that data be incorporated into your tests? Um, also, the Selenium IDE is very much a work in progress at the moment. Um, as we uh, get more users, as more people start filing bug reports, we find more and more edge cases happening. Um, and those edge cases, uh, as we fix them, make the product more stable um, and better suited for your testing needs. So if you do find a problem when you're using Selenium IDE, then keep it to yourself. Feel free to file a bug, let us know about it, um, and that allows us to fix the problem. In fact, you could probably record a test using the IDE and then go, this test doesn't work because I was expecting this to happen, and that would be super useful. We'd then be using the IDE to fix the IDE, and then everything is turtles all the way down. It's crazy, but a lot of fun. And the Selenium IDE is part of our roadmap to um, Selenium 4. Now, you may have heard us talking about this before in other venues, but I think it's quite nice to be able to uh, cover that now. Um, Selenium IDE, we've covered. Language exports, super important. Um, and we're hoping that there's going to be an ecosystem of plugins that people use um, and take advantage of in order to make their tests maintainable um, moving forward. You can imagine something like, as a plugin, by the way, implementations of page objects. That would be really nice, wouldn't it? Um, we're working on Selenium WebDriver improvements. So this is going to be taking the existing APIs, making them sleeker, making them um, better, uh, removing features that people don't use, and adding features that people want. Um, in particular, one of the things that we're thinking about is fit and finish. Um, how do we make uh, Selenium easier to use and your tests more stable? The other thing we're working on is Selenium Grid. When Francois wrote Selenium Grid all those years ago, um, you would be lucky to have uh, five machines that you would be able to run all your tests on. In fact, I remember seeing the early grid that he had, which is just one server with many virtual machines running. Nowadays, we have things like Docker, uh, we have um, AWS, we have EC2, we have Google Compute Pro, uh, Platform, GCP, all sorts of things. So what we want to be able to do is make it easy for you to plug Selenium Grid into um, that new next generation technology that is out there. As a key part of that, we intend to make Selenium Grid observable. That is, you'll be able to see the traffic moving between um, the various nodes of the grid. And so when there is a problem, we can diagnose that problem and, uh, pr uh, and identify the source of bugs quickly um, and readily. But one of the key pieces on this is going to be Selenium IDE. This is going to be how people start using Selenium. It has been for many years, and it will be for the foreseeable future. It's a really great way of getting started with the ecosystem. So although there's lots of fancy technical stuff coming down the line, um, of which almost no one but DevOps are interested, or of which no one but developers are interested, I think every tester is going to be interested in what we're doing with Selenium IDE. And in particular, what you can do with Selenium IDE. And I'm really looking forward to seeing that. So 
um, what I have done is I have left some time at the end for any questions that people may ask. Um, hopefully, this is giving you an idea of what's going to happen, where we're going and how we're going to do it. If you want to get involved, do come along um, and join the project. Um, we have a Slack channel, which you can join. We have an IRC channel, which you can join. And you can find uh, links for joining all of this stuff on the Selenium website, which is at seleniumhq.org. Um, but for now, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, so we have quite a lot of them. Uh, and uh, as usual, we'll start at the top. <laughs> um, so first of all, that was even before we started the session, uh, someone wanted to know when uh, will Grid, grid uh, 4.0 be launched. Uh, so we shipped what I think is the last version of Selenium 3 um, this morning, UK time. Um, it's available to download right now. I need to modify the websites and just update the links. Um, the pre-alpha version of Grid 4 is in our tree right now. Um, there are two changes that I need to make in order to get us to the point where we can release the alphas. The first change is the distributed tracing that I've been talking about, the, the observability. We have most of that in place. Um, there's some tweaking, um, and we need to write up some instructions on how to use that. But that is well underway. Um, and the second thing is we need to um, be able to um, distribute tests um, evenly across the grid. Right now, the um, implementation we have for doing that is very, very naive. Um, I have patches for that as well. If I sat down and were just to focus on this, this would be about a week's worth of work, maybe two weeks. Um, in reality, I have a day job. I am a, an engineer at Deliveroo um, in the UK, and uh, obviously I'm working on Selenium on my copious free time. Um, but I expect it to come early next year. We'll take Christmas off, we'll do some hacking, um, we'll have some fun, and then yeah, maybe mid-January, uh, we should see the alphas uh, starting to become available. Um, if you want to move the process along, do come and join the project. Come and help us. Um, if you know Java, really happy to talk to you about it. If you don't know Java, really happy to help you get started. Next question. Next question. Uh, can the new IDE read scripts saved by the old IDE? Uh, can the new IDE? Um, no, it can't. But one of the things that we are planning on doing is providing a tool that allows you to take the old scripts um, and reformat them in the in the new format that we use, the uh, SIDE format. Um, so one of the key things that we have with the Selenium project is a, a passion for backward compatibility. One of the things you can do right now is you can take uh, your scripts written for Selenium 1, um, Selenium RC, and you can run them with the latest, greatest version of, of Gecko Driver uh, across a new Selenium 4 pre-alpha grid, um, and everything will work the way you want it to. Um, it's really important that once, once people have made an investment, um, that investment is not wasted. So yeah, we are planning on writing a tool to allow you to take your existing tests and export them, but we haven't written it yet because I mean, we've only got so much engineering effort to spend. Again, that would be a really nice way for people to get involved with the project. So please come along um, and join us. We'd really appreciate the help. Um, I hope that answers the question. I know it's not satisfactory. I know that you would like to hear, yes, you can just load them up now. We are working on it. It's something that we want, um, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, next question. Uh, yeah. Uh, so you mentioned Gecko Driver. So we got a question. Do we need to install Gecko Driver in order to use Selenium SideRunner, or does Gecko Driver come with the IDE plugin? Um, if you use the IDE plugin, you don't need anything else. You can just hit play button in the IDE. It will play in your current browser. Um, that's really nice. Uh, on the command line, um, I can't remember off the top of my head. I think you may need the version of Gecko Driver because Gecko Driver and Chrome Driver and Safari Driver and the Edge Driver 
are all tied to the particular version of the browser you have on your operating system. Um, it needs to be updated not with Selenium IDE, but with the version of the browser that you have. Um, so it's always a good idea to, to manage that yourself. One of the capabilities we're planning on adding for running the tests, um, and, and Tomo showed this off at Selenium Conf, um, and it's really nifty, is the ability to take your test um, and from Selenium ID itself, just point it at a Selenium server and have that Selenium server run the test for you. Um, so uh, in the simple case, you don't need anything else. You just need your browser with the Selenium ID extension, and we will run the test within the ID. Uh, uh, within the IDE and the browser you have installed. Um, if you want to test with different uh, browsers, then you will need the Gecko driver, the Chrome driver um, installed on your machine. Next question, so before, please. Uh, we take, yeah, before we take the next question, I just wanted to mention two things. So first of all, I see all your uh, compliments to Simon. Simon, apparently they really enjoyed your presentation. Uh, keep them coming. Uh, obviously, I won't go through them now, but I promise to send all of them uh, to Simon after the session. So anything you want to tell him, uh, be my guest. I will make sure that he gets uh, all your comments. Uh, and the second, uh, I, we, I, I know that we won't be able to answer all the questions uh, during this session, but, we w but I will ask uh, the IDE team at Apply Tools uh, to take some of the load for the questions that we won't be able to answer live here and give you answers. So worthwhile asking anyway. So just fire away, uh, and whatever Simon won't be able to have, won't have time to answer now, we will try to answer later on. Uh, so that was just uh, two comments. And again, I'm getting a lot of questions about the recording. Yeah, I will send a link to the recording by Friday. That should land in your inbox by Friday. Don't worry about it. Next question. Um, are the page load wait times handled automatically by the E? Uh, is there a default a, a default value for that? Uh, well, as you saw, it does do a good job of waiting for the um, elements to be present. Um, uh, it uses a mechanism very similar to the old Selenium ID. So if you were familiar with that, it's basically the same. Um, so there is a timeout, and that timeout, um, I believe, is configurable. Um, but I don't have that right in front of me right now. Um, I didn't trust the internet to be working properly when I did this, so I recorded all those uh, all those demos for you. Um, but that is part of the documentation that we should be writing for this. Um, can the IDE run headless tests? Can it run headless tests? If you use the Selenium IDE runner um, that I showed you, that command line tool, you can pass lots of capabilities. And if you're using Firefox or uh, Chrome, then you can ask that to start in headless mode. And so yes, you can run those tests uh, in headless mode. Um, in addition, if you have um, Selenium installed or in time, the new Selenium grid, um, you'll be able to use Docker to run your um, uh, browser instances, which will allow them to run effectively headless because you can't peer into a Docker instance um, unless you do anything. So there are two different mechanisms you could use for running headless tests. Um, they are supported. Uh, one of the old ways of running headless tests was a tool called PhantomJS. Uh, PhantomJS, the author of that, has ceased development of it. And so that is no longer supported moving forward, um, not because we don't think it's a good idea, but because the tool itself has stopped active development. Um, and therefore, there's not much we could do. But Chrome and Firefox, um, headless support for those is, is both possible by passing through the capabilities on the command line. Next question. Um, Selenium IDE uses JavaScript, and if you need NPM or Yarn, does that mean you also need Node.js as well, or are, or are there other versions for other languages, for example, C Sharp or Java? Okay, so if all you want to do is record and playback tests in your browser, you do not need Node, you don't need the Selenium IDE runner, um, there's nothing else you need. You just need to go to the add-on store or the Chrome store um, and install the extension. If you want to run the tests, then the test runner itself at the moment is written uh, in, in JavaScript and it uses um, Node in order to run. And so in order to install the Selenium IDE runner, yes, you do need um, one of those, uh, you, you need Node installed. However, 
Once you have exported the tests to a programming language such as C, uh, C Sharp or Java um, or Python or Ruby, once that e export capability is there, you won't need Node on the machines after that. You'll, you just need the JVM or um, the .NET runtime or the Ruby runtime or whatever it is that you've exported the test to. So that node requirement is really just if you want to run the Selenium IDE runner. I hope that answers the question in a way that makes you feel happy and confident. The key takeaway is you don't need node if you just want to record and playback tests. You only need node if you want to do things on the command line. Next question. Um, any plans on integrating database connectivity so we can choose between CSV or database table? You know, that would make a really good plugin. Um, I don't think we've got any plans for that ourselves um, because uh, I have no idea how to implement it. However, if you do, um, that would be a really good plugin to have, um, particularly once we have the data-driven testing in place and you could use that as a framework in order to, to build from, from there. Um, so we probably won't add it to begin with, um, but you might be able to do it later on if you needed to. One of the reasons for that, by the way, is because we are running in the browser, um, and the browser is a JavaScript sandbox. So in order to connect to the database, we'd need some sort of JavaScript database plugin that would allow us to query the database, and that would be quite tricky. Maybe we could do something on the command line. But once you're on the command line, you could use whatever the um, database access mechanisms are for the particular language in order to access the database. So with the CSV, we can upload that file that can be held um, by the browser and it can access it. Um, database connections are a bit trickier. But if you figure it out, an amazing plugin that we'd love to see. Next question. Um, can you do data parameterization, for example, where we have a form and want to send different data values? Uh, yeah, that's part of the data-driven testing. I'm nodding. That's not a very useful way of, of communicating on an audio-only me uh, media, but I'm nodding. <laughs> um, well, it's good to know. At least you're communicating it. Um, so we are out of time, but uh, I'm going to end with uh, something uh, completely different. Um, so, uh, a few people asked, uh, maybe you could uh, say a few words on the Selenium approval status by the W3C. So in June um, this year, June 2018, uh, we moved to a recommendation, which is um, the W3C's way of saying this is now a standard that is meant to be implemented by browser vendors. Um, we've got a lot of support from the browser vendors. If you have Mac OS, uh, you already have Safari driver installed on your machine. If you use the technology preview of Safari, uh, you will find you also have the technology preview of the Safari driver. Um, and that's probably the best way of using Safari driver at the moment. Uh, Microsoft have done an amazing job. Um, and if you have Edge and the latest Windows builds, um, you can install the Edge driver, the Microsoft Web Driver is the official name, uh, from uh, the, the central mechanism for installing software. So that's cool. Um, Mozilla have pulled out all the stops with the Gecko driver, um, and they have uh, the most uh, spec compliant implementation uh, by a browser vendor, um, and it's really nice to see. And uh, Chrome are currently putting, dotting the I's and crossing the T's on their W3C implementation as well. Um, we expect to see that by the end of the year. So by the time Selenium 4 ships, there will be W3C implementations uh, for all the major browser vendors. Um, and I couldn't be more excited. It's super, uh, super nice to see. We are also working on level two of the specification, which adds the ability to do things like um, log in to sites that require authentication. We know that's something that people really want. Um, and we're figuring out how to integrate nicely uh, with the various dev tooling um, that is available. So if you want to get console logs, um, if you want to get uh, notified of events within the browser, we're adding that capability to WebDriver as well. It's going to be really nice. So uh, we are unfortunately out of time. 
Uh, before I let Simon uh, uh, bid farewell to all of you, I'll just remind you uh, again that I saw all your thank you notes to Simon and I will pass them on. I will try to get all your Selenium IDE questions uh, answered by the Apply Tools IDE team. Uh, so keep them coming until we uh, we close off the session. And I just want to remind you that the link to the recording of this session will be emailed to you by Friday. And of course, I hope to see you uh, all in our next event. And I want to thank you all for joining us for this live session. And of course, uh, thank uh, the always brilliant and always interesting and always so provoking Simon Stewart. So thank you, Simon. Thank you very much for inviting me. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.